and then standby chief we're going to go to the open thank you for tuning in to another episode of chief chat Two, one, go. <laughs> yeah, hear me? Where are you? Oh, okay, I got you. I got you. Hey, you're back. We're back. Maybe oh, we should try that. You want to try to get try that? Try your intro again. Oh, okay, I, I can do it again. It I, I got good. it. Yes, sir. Thank it you. Okay. Good. Take take two. <laughs> <laughs> what is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. How y'all doing, ladies? Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. So was it better the first or the second time? It was um, great both times. On point. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So uh, super excited about today because we got a double header uh, chief chat today. So we had, and, and you know, if we have a double header, we're going to have some some big hitter guests. So uh this 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 guest right here just take me back to when I was 16 years old. So I was kind of telling the story before we got on the air. Um, 16 years old, me and my best friends riding around in a Chrysler New Yorker with a, a adapter, one of those CD adapter tape deck things, uh, playing uh, the blue CD. We call it the blue CD, uh, but it's the I remember you CD. Uh, I think it was back 95, 96 time frame, and man that. That took me through my man, what we call our manish years, right? So the, my my manish years, uh, this this next guest really uh, helped me uh, navigate through that time in my life. So without no, you got something, Julie? What you got? No, I keep going. I love it. Okay. So without further ado, Julie, please introduce today's guest. Chief, you are so right. We have an R&B legend with us today. He's a singer, songwriter, producer. He plays just about every instrument you can think of, has sold 25 million albums, and is a 16-time Grammy Award nominee. Please help me welcome Brian McKnight to Chief Chat. Hey. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'll clap for me, too. <laughs> Can't hear you. Uh oh. Can't hear that one. <laughs> That's on me. There we go. Okay. Um, <laughs> try this again. <laughs> Brian, thanks so much for joining us and everybody watching. You know what to do. Drop a note in the comments. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Share some love with Brian and any questions you have, we'll read those live. Follow us and enable your notifications so you stay in the know about our lineup. Chief Chats are every week. We have a great military exclusive lineup just for you like Brian. So welcome. So man, Brian, great to meet you and it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Can you let uh, our folks know uh, where you're joining us from today? So today uh, I'm in uh, right outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I tend to be other places too, but today you happen to catch me here. <laughs> And ATL. Okay, that's cool. That's great, Brian. And after releasing, you know, so many albums over the last 20 years, you've said that this last album, Exodus, would be your last. What prompted that decision? Well, it's actually been next come next year to be 30 years. That's crazy. Wow. Wow. Um you know, we've come into a, a very different time where music is very, very, very singles oriented. Um, mm -hmm. After releasing 20, I thought 20 was a good number to sort of take a step back. And I released that 20th during the pandemic. And it made me realize that I can still write songs, I can still put songs out, but really honestly, the ones that count the most are the singles. So 
as I write, as I continue to write, you'll probably see more singles released than actual entire albums. So it's not necessarily I'm like I'm retiring. I'm not retiring, at least not yet. But as far as actually putting out entire albums or CDs or uh, streaming, whatever we call them these days, you probably won't yeah. see another one of those. <laughs> gotcha. So, so you're working uh, smarter, not harder. Is that is that what we're gonna call it? That's the key. The key is to not have to work at all. <laughs> and get to a point where, um, I think my grandfather told me that if you're doing something that you love, it's not work. And, you know, luckily since I was 19, I never really had to have a job because I'm, I do something that I love to do. I love to create music. Um, and I'll always create music. The job part comes in when you have to travel all over the place. And I'm not, I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. I have a great time doing concerts and traveling all over the world. But sometimes the another plane, another hotel room, another backstage, not knowing where you are. And after doing that for 30 years, you, know, you just kind of want to look at your life differently. And, you know, I, I got married four years ago. To the love of my life and i you know sometimes i just want to just be with leilani and not do anything and we do a whole lot of that so that's kind of <laughs> what that was that. fantastic and you've written a lot of songs throughout your career so can you share with us what is your process and then what do you draw on for the lyrics so <clears throat> my process has always been the same there is no process um because everyone has a, a an iPhone or an Android phone, whatever phone you have, you have some form of a, a streaming device, um, whether it's iTunes, whatever you use. And there are playlists in there. And you have playlists of your favorite songs or playlists of your favorite artists. And I have that too, but I also have a playlist of songs that are in my head that are constantly playing that haven't been written yet. Um, so I hear this music, there's probably usually four or five to 10 works in progress going on all the time. Now, before I met Leilani, I was just writing abstract in, in, in an abstract way because I didn't really have a subject. I didn't have anything to draw upon. I was really just writing songs based on every other song that I'd written or something I saw in a movie or you, know, you hear back at one or that entire I Remember You album. I'm sorry, Chief. It was all imagination. I didn't, I have no idea what I was talking about. I was really just trying to, I was trying to imitate all the other songs I've heard because I'm an audiophile. I, every piece of music I've ever heard, I know. When I hear music, I see it. Um, I have what people call sort of total recall. I don't have to sit down to play a song when I hear it. I, kn I, I know it. I can just sit down and, and play it. So that's what goes on. The, the day I met Leilani, she has been the inspiration for every song I've written since that day. It's been nine years. Man. So I can tell you back from, I remember you, of course, if you ever need a song, and this is for the fellas out there, if you ever need a song to put you back in the game with your lady, man, go to I Remember You and pretty much play any song on that album. I promise you. <laughs> it works. You, you, it works. It, it, it absolutely works. So is, is there a particular song that means the most to you that you've uh, written? You know, there's a song on Exodus called Nobody which I think is the greatest song that I've ever written. And it, it I was sitting on the bed, uh, I think last January, and Leilani was just blow drying her hair in the bathroom. I could see her from the bed and just shows you the kind of inspiration that she, she gives me, the words to this song. And what the song says is that it's the 100% faithful song. Um, so I'm sure a lot of fellas out there that need that song to help them with whatever they're dealing with at the time. <laughs> And the song says, I'll hold nobody's hand but yours, and I'll kiss nobody's lips but yours, because I'll be nobody's man but yours. And it's 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 the 100 percent faithful song for us. Um, you know, it's it just means the most because because of where it came from. I would not have that song without her. Oh. Yeah, that's that's, that's yeah, that's good. Man. <laughs> You have you have chief speechless, so that's really good. I know, I'm just like, <laughs> never <man>. speechless. <laughs> Nobody. Okay, I, that's another one. I'm telling you, he gonna, he gonna get you back in the game. Whatever, whatever happens in your life, we we all have life that happens to us. So uh, you're gonna save that up for one day for Mrs. Osby, huh? Mrs. Osby's gonna be hearing that. 
<laughs> well, the music industry, man, it's been a hard year and a half, uh, basically you know, shut down during the pandemic. How did you stay connected with your fans during this time? You know, that's the one, one of the good things about social media is that you can, you can let people know as little or as much as you want them to know about you. And it's an, it's a way to sort of stay connected. And I think a lot of, a lot of folks, artists and, you know, their fans alike, I think before this all happened, there may have been a little bit of, I mean, for lack of a better word, entitlement, because everything was so available. Mm -hmm. You could see anyone, you could talk to anyone, you could get in touch with just about anyone all the time. I think that what that year and a half showed people, and I think it's evidence in the shows I've done since the shows have been back, that people are more attentive, they're more in attendance, they're more present than they've ever been because I feel like they never thought that something like that would be taken away. And because it was taken away, they're hungry for something again that I think before that happened that they, they weren't as hungry as they appear to be now. And I think it's it's a wonderful thing to see the you know the amounts of people that have come out the way they're engaged um, has been a sight to behold. It's you know I I wouldn't say I was jaded before the pandemic, but I was a little bit because you can't do something that long the same way from, um, without there being some semblance of of the same kind of thing happening over and over again. So even for me, I needed the break. I needed to be able to step back and rethink my show, re rethink the way I sing, the way I write. So being on stage again, I'm appreciating it more. And I think my appreciation is also going out into the audience as well, because they seem like they really missed something that I thought, I think that they could have been taken a little bit for granted. Agree. That was very well said. Um, and the good news is, is that concerts are back. Um, yeah. You've got a heavy show load for the rest of the year. So it'll I be do. interesting it's to see crazy how <laughs> crazy how that happens, right? So it'll be yeah. interesting to see how engaged people are um, when they get to come back and see you in person again. But how excited yeah. are you to get back out there um, and play in front of your fans once again? Well, it's interesting. I think uh, Sunday's show was the seventh one I've done since things have been back. And if I just hope this this enthusiasm continues because I, I think what people don't understand is the, the more engaged the audience is, the better it is for us on stage. And, you know, a, a Wednesday show is usually pretty good because people are, are sort of halfway, halfway through the week. Thursday shows are always awesome because people know that the weekend is coming. Friday yeah. shows, Friday shows tend to be a little more docile because they've been working all day and they've either come straight Tired. from work or they this is the end of the week. Saturday shows are incredible because they had <laughs> you know, Friday night. So there's there's this whole thing that I at least with my audience I've seen. Maybe if for bigger artists it's always super enthusiastic, but I know that you know I sing. I'm a love song singer. I sing ballads, and people. It takes a lot to keep people engaged, and so I have to bring a lot of personality, and I have to put those up tempos in the perfect place, and then I have to be funny, which I'm really, really funny. But people don't know that until they come and see this. Yes, I'm tooting my own horn. But it's yeah. it's it's very. That's a real psychological thing putting these shows together because <clears throat> my show is very different than other people's because it is storytelling because I'm a songwriter, it is my stories that I'm telling, <laughs> not to be redundant, but yeah. um, it, it's, it's interesting to put those shows together to keep people engaged, because it's an hour and a half. I, I believe people's attention spans are really only about 90 minutes. Yeah. Beyond, that's why you go see a movie that's two and a half hours, you're like, man, it was really good, but they could have cut this, this, and this, and that, it would have been great, because 90 <laughs> minutes is pretty much the cutoff. So that's what I'm dealing with. So on your on your concert run, so on Valentine's Day, are you kind of strategic on like who what city you're going to on Valentine's Day, or or how does that work? Uh, you know, I don't, as the artist, I don't really get to decide where I go. The promoters and hmm. my agent sort of decide, and you know, because I've been doing it so long, you sort of hit the same places every year. You're, there's very few surprises as far as where we go. It's just when. 
Um, and you tend to, you know, a year to 14 months or so, if you have hit a place, you probably won't be back for that period of time. So it's much more scientific than people think. It's not just, hey, we're doing a show this weekend. Everybody just shows up. You know, there's a kind of have to start promoting it six to nine months out. You, you there's there's a whole lot that goes into the the concept of touring because i'm just one artist you know how many artists there are there are literally hundreds of thousands of artists and they're all touring at the same time (laughs) (laughs) well i mean i could just imagine you know brian when i come into uh, a venue on valentine's day uh getting getting the getting the the ambiance right for for (laughs) valentine's day as a whole and so uh, well you know what's interesting is every Every one of my shows is a Valentine's Day show because it's all about love. It's all about, yeah. it's all about the greatest decade. I wouldn't say decade, the greatest 12 to 14 years of musical history. And I'm talking about from about 1986 to about 1990, uh, to 2002. I think it's the greatest period of music. Amen. Absolutely. Say that again. Say that again, Brian. About 86 to, not, not saying that those other periods weren't good. I'm talking about if you take that just as a sample of music from 86, I might have to say from 83, because then it includes Thriller and uh, Purple Rain and uh, Billy Joel's. And, you know, if you said about 83 to about 2002, about 19 years, probably the greatest, you know, musical <laughs> period of time in history. <laughs> I, I absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's. Yeah, I grew up. I grew up during that time frame, and uh, man, just, just a, music just kind of was a, a huge part of my life, and uh, it just it, it kind of walked me through life. Cause I, I mean, I grew up single single parent household, uh, just trying to learn the birds and the bees, and so you taught me the birds and the bees along with other uh, artists. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, I was gonna apologize whoa, to you. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> chief. Cause you gotta remember, chief. I wasn't. I wasn't really an adult when I made these records. I wrote I wrote my first record when I was 19. The whole thing, all those songs are written at 19. So I really hadn't been through anything. So the record you're talking about, I wrote all those songs when I was 22. So it's like kids leading kids in a, in yeah. a certain way, even though I think that now 22 <laughs> is like 18 and our 22 was more like 25, but weird how <laughs> that, that works out, but. You know, I think that most of us, nobody knows, nobody knows anything. Nobody has a clue about um, interpersonal relationships. And that's from therapists on down the line. All we do is we, we, we go into them hoping for the best and trying to do the best that we can and be the best person you can be and hope that the other person is doing the same thing. What I tried to do was find these, these moments in your life that are this, at this moment in time, this is the way people feel. And they've been through this situation. They've been in this happy situation. They've been in this sad situation. And if I can write that story and write their story that way, then maybe they can, they can relate to it and 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 find some hope in their happiness and in their misery. Absolutely. So, uh, Brian, you collaborated with a, a ton of folks uh, to include mm-hmm. Mariah Carey, Kobe, Kalei, Justin Timberlake, just a big diverse group of people that you've uh, collabed with. Do you have anybody on your collaboration bucket list? You know, I I never look at collaborations as as ooh, I really need to work with this person or that person. We live at a time where if you look at everybody's record, every single song is featuring someone and featuring someone and featuring mm-hmm. someone and featuring somebody else. I'm very weird and I'm really personal <laughs> about my art. And I feel like I'm I feel like I'm the greatest artist to me <laughs> in, in my world. And I have a hard time sharing that with other people on my albums and say, hey, sometimes it feels like if I don't have all these people on my record, then it won't be as good. And I kind of feel like my songs don't necessarily lend themselves to this. But if if, if an artist wants to work with me, I'm, I'm gung ho to do that. I, I love writing and, and finding new ways to write songs, but I don't necessarily have a, a, an artist bucket list of people I want to work with. But that being said, if if Post Malone called me and wanted to do a song with me, I think I'd be like, that'd be very cool. 
because I think he's really talented. And I think yeah, that yeah, we yeah. got our cars together and we came up with something to be very cool, but I'm not sitting there going, man, I really can't wait for the phone to ring. Or it's weird for me to pick up the phone and say, would you please do a song with me? I used to be really good back in the 90s. <laughs> That'd be kind of, be kind of, kind of weird for me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. hey, so, so Post Malone, you looking at it, you know, he don't want to act for it. Y'all collab, y'all do something <laughs> together. Uh, yeah, that'll be amazing. And, but I'll tell you I one collab. That, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you one collab that I really, really enjoy. And it's probably one of my favorite Christmas songs. It was you and Boys to Men when y'all did the Let It Snow. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I, I play I play that in like July. I, I don't even know yeah. why. I, have, I, funny, I, don't, you know, I, I wrote it in June. I, we were I doing that Christmas record in June. It was hot and we were in London. They were on tour and I'm in the studio making that record with them. <laughs> and uh, I'm walking down the street uh, in the middle of the hottest day of the year. And that tune just popped into my head and we recorded it. Um, and now it's like a Christmas favorite. It's just funny that how that how that happens. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Brian, we have soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines, guardians, Coast Guard members, military families watching from all over the world with us. Do you have any words of hope or inspiration that you'd like to share with our nation's heroes today? Of course. Um, our nation exists because of the selfless sacrifice that all of you do for all of us. And I can't thank you enough for doing what you do on a daily basis. The things that the rest of us don't necessarily see, but we know are happening. Um, you know, watching what's happening as our troops are leaving Afghanistan now that they've left. I mean, it was it was appalling some of the things that I was seeing. But the fact that America is always there for not only just for us, but for for seemingly the whole world and that somebody's child, somebody's father, somebody's brother, somebody's sister, somebody's aunt is out there on that front line preserving our way of life and trying to make other people's lives better is a debt that none of us can pay for you. We'll never be able to thank you enough. We'll never be able to do enough. There won't be enough interviews I can do or songs I can write or shows I can do for you. Um, that will tell you how much I thank you for that sacrifice. And I really, really, my family and I thank you and appreciate you so much. Thank you for those words, Brian. Um, I'm sure that means a lot to the folks out there um, listening. So um, going back to, to music um, in your career. So there's been so many, you know, flash in the pan artists that are here today and gone tomorrow and, you just said it's been almost 30 years for you. So what's the key to your longevity? Um, really good tailoring. I have a really great tailor that does my clothes. I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 I wish I knew. I wish I knew that there was something I could bottle and sell that would have artists last a long period of time. I can only tell you what I did. I, I kind of think of my career as being in a submarine. And I'm in the sub and I'm, I'm doing my work and I'm going around diligently, you know, writing my songs. And every now and then I'll put the periscope up and I'll see where I'm at and I immediately pull it back down and go back to work. And I've done that for 30 years. And that's how I got here. Wow. Man, that was, that's it. That was, that's it? That was, that was, <laughs> listen, just dropping jewels. <laughs> so, so I, I got this, I had this quote that I saw on my social media today. It says, failure is not the opposite of success. It's a part of success. And so uh, speaking on that note, do you have any particular moments that stand out to you? Maybe failures or successes that, that really uh, kind of shaped or formed you uh, to the man you are today? I'll just say this, there is no such thing as an overnight success. Um, it may seem that way to people because at least for myself, when my first record came out, people knew about it that day. They don't know that it took three years <clears throat> of toiling and writing. Mm -hmm. I wrote 75, almost 80 songs for that record and only 13 made it. 
that meant that all the other songs were failures. All the other ones weren't worthy of being on an album. Um, I saw lots of other artists come out, lots of other, I got passed over by lots of other labels before the label that signed me signed me. Um, all of those things could have made me resentful, it could have made me give up. Um, there's been, you know, the career of a, of a music artist is an ebb and flow. You know, you, you can start here, you're going to get somewhere, and at some point you're going to start tapering off, you're going to see the other side of the, of the hill, and at any one of those moments you can choose to to, to give up or to blame people or to, um, to, to anything, you know, uh, there's always ups and downs. It's not how many times you fall, it's how many times you get up. You got to just keep getting up. Yep. Hmm. Thank you for that. Oh, that's, imp that's important. No matter whether you're, um, a civilian like me and Leah, or whether you're serving like chief or whether you're, a you know, recording artists like you, that's advice everybody can appreciate and, and walk away with. Thank you for that. I wanted to pause just for, oh, thank you. <laughs> Didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> I wanted to pause just for a moment and take a look at our live Facebook feed where we have people watching from all over the world. Um, Marie says, hello. <laughs> and Missy O'Brien Jones says, good morning. Marie is watching from Carswell, which is uh, in Fort Worth. And Caroline Lower it says, good morning from Washington State. And Kimberly Morris is watching from Randolph Air Force Base, Texas. Kelsey is watching from Bahrain. And John says that he's really glad he didn't head out to go shopping at the exchange yet because he was finishing his coffee and was just getting ready to go. But now he gets to <laughs> chat with you. Um, I've been to a number of exchanges, so I, I get it. You, 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 you want to get there and get, get there early, make sure whatever you were trying to get is, is, is still there. So yeah. I, I understand. And he was um, super glad that he uh, he hung on for a second. Bruce says that the pandemic has made him um, buy more music and movies. And let's see, what else do we have? Bruce also says that the memory stick in his car has 6,972 songs on it and that he is a digital music addict. Um, <laughs> Sounds like it. Ryan, Ryan Smith says, one of my favorites is Groovin' Tonight with Nelly, and it's so epic to have you here with us today. Um, Mark Matthews, he wants to know if you can, if you can repeat <laughs> steps one through three. <laughs> So this is a, on, on Twitter, there's been several uh, people who don't understand um, the counting system in back at one. Because they're not really, I, I have this debate, my wife and I talk about this all the time, because most people take one part of the lyric and don't listen to the whole thing. And without listening to the whole lyric of, the, of a song, you're not going to get what the author is trying to convey. So the number system in back at one really has nothing to do with steps. What it basically is saying is, is that you you should never be complacent about where you are in your relationship. You should continue to do all the things that got you there. If you stop doing any of them, it's going to break down. It is. Uh, so, you know, when people are dating, you know, they're putting on their best face. They're 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 putting on their best outfits. They're on their best behavior. And then over time, some of those things can tend to erode. And this song is really just about continuing to do all of those things that got you there and that's what keeps you there yeah and i want to i, I want to give a huge, huge <laughs> shout out yeah i love that song too uh, but i want to give a huge shout out to the chief mass sergeant of the air force uh joanne bass uh we were at a conference and they found out that i was going to be uh, uh interviewing you and she said that you are absolutely her favorite artist uh, oh, wow. <laughs> and, and so uh, mm -hmm. i want to give a shout out to the chief master on air force bass she, she's I was like, hey, do you want to say something to him or whatever? She's like, no, I just want you to tell him that I love him. So uh, she finds our Air Force back. So. Thank you. Aww, <laughs> best. That's awesome. Uh, and then Steven I have one Soto. more comment. I run oh, oh, go sorry, ahead. Julie. You go. No, no, you, no, no, you go. <laughs> no, you. Steven Soto is on Chief's page and he says, what's up, Chief? Chief chat killing it with good guests on. Yay. Appreciate that. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. 
And I have one more I wanted to read from John Sellers. He says, I have been married for 49 years to the love of my life. I know exactly how he feels and how a wife can inspire you. I don't know if he can see the comments, but a little more inspiration for him and all is uh, last week he had emergency surgery on his back. He said, just before I was going into surgery, at the surgery room, for some reason, the doctor asked me about what medicine I could not live without, and I immediately replied that that would be my wife and family. Family matters most. So. Oh, man. Uh -huh. Deep yeah. thoughts coming from our chief chat yeah. viewers. I know. Y'all get deep in the chat. I see y'all. I see y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and speaking of love, um, Brian, you're very vocal about your love for your wife, Leilani. Um, you've shared many different inspirations uh, about her today. So uh, you've shared little nuggets, but how much has she been an inspiration for you and your songwriting? Well, she's been the chief influence. She's been, you know, if you listen to the music I wrote, um, when we were talking about back at one, I've, I, the inspiration from that song, the actual nuts and bolts came from me putting together my home theater in my house at the time, reading the manual for a DVD player. I had to draw on so many other things because I didn't think love existed. I didn't think that love um, could endure the way the songs and movies and literature tells us that it does because I didn't, I didn't know anybody that had it. I didn't know anybody that that if they thought they had it, they definitely didn't keep it. When she came into my life, it changed everything about my life, 180 degrees to the man that I am today. I am nothing like what I was because that's what, you know, being in love with the greatest woman in the world can do for you. And that's what the, the, the fellow who just talked about his family, that's what he is talking about. Um, when it's right and you have that synergy between two people. I mean, we we are together every second of the day, every single day, and all I want is more. All I want is more. Man, are we, are we writing a song right now? I think we are. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're known to the masses for your, your, you know, your strong falsetto and your excellent voice, of course. But uh, you you decide to appear on the mass dancer instead of the mass singer. So can you kind of tell us what that experience was like, and why did you choose the <clears throat> dancing version of the one? Well, first thing is that I didn't I didn't call them. <laughs> they, <laughs> they called me. <laughs> you know the way these shows work is I like I can't tell them what show I want to do. And the problem with doing the mass singer is is how many people aren't going to know that I'm me when I open my mouth to sing. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. I, I could point you out of lineup any day. So, yeah. <laughs> Unless I try to disguise my voice or something else, but then that's kind of defeating the purpose. So I understood it when they asked. Now, doing the show itself, I, I don't dance. I, uh, I, was, I was an athlete. I hooped. I played football. And that was, it was, you have to also understand, the age that I am, it wasn't cool to sing. The kids that I went to high school with didn't know I could sing, that I could play instruments. That I could beat up at a time when that was okay. That's definitely not okay now, but that was okay mm -mm. back then. Uh, so I kept that. That was a church thing. It was definitely not a school thing. Um, so, you know, dancing is not my thing. So and if I was going to dance, I better have on a, a, a mask and an outfit so nobody knows that it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so that part was, was fun. Yeah, was it hot? Because we, we talked to some folks that were on Mass Singer and they were in the in the costume and they were like, "Man, this this thing is hot." So I can imagine if if it's singing is hot, if you dance, then it's probably yeah. a little bit on a cold. My cricket outfit was actually pretty light. It okay. wasn't it wasn't mm -hmm. cumbersome at all. It wasn't it was some of those costumes. I could see how it could have been very very uncomfortable. But mine wasn't. You know, I had to. I, I guess it might help because I'm pretty tall, so they needed to make me into something that wasn't enough. I'd have been like a bowling ball or something else. <laughs> I don't know. That might have been crazy. <laughs> Some of those other costumes, but it helped that they they had to put me pretty much in just tights and a mask. That was pretty good. So, so I got another follow-on question. So, do you? What's your go-to karaoke song? <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> I think I've done karaoke like three times in my life. 
Um, it's not even fair. It's not even karaoke when you can sing, though. It's it's not even fair. <laughs> well, it is. It still is yeah. because the music is very cheesy and it's it's supposed to be fun. And there's usually usually lots of alcohol involved in a karaoke Absolutely. situation. <laughs> so you're kind of a slave to whatever they have on the playlist. So if you can find a Michael Jackson like you know Rock with You or Beat It or Billie Jean, you're you're pretty good. Got you. What about you, Chief? Got you asked, so I'm, now you remind I'm, us. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm a Purple Rain karaoke kind of guy because I, I can talk through the whole lyrics. I don't have to sing. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> All you need is like a lighter or a cell phone light, and then just talk, and then you you can get this Purple Rain pretty good. And then everybody else is gonna sing with you anyway doing Purple Rain. So it's it's a very strategic song whenever I'm drinking. That is in, in very a smart. Party. Very smart. Someday, Chief, we're going to get you out to karaoke and hear that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to bring y'all up there, too, because y'all y'all going to be like Apollonia, uh, in the, you know, you in Apollonia. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll no. just lip sync. I'll pretend. Yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> you do not want me singing. I promise you that. <laughs> You, you don't want me singing either. <laughs> so, Brian, uh, your your latest project is your first ever dance club remix um, EP titled Remixed. So what can fans expect to hear on this album? Maybe finally a Brian McKnight song that you can dance to in a club. That, that was the only thing I was thinking when they brought me the idea. I really didn't have much to do with it because they basically just took songs from Exodus and sort of remixed them. Um, how they were feeling about it. And the the DJ that did it, he he had a really great track record of doing this kind of record. And I'd never done anything like that. And I didn't really have to do anything but hand him over the files of the songs I'd already done. It's like, do your thing, man. And, and there he is. I, I, I'd never thought about that before, but it's nice to, to do something different. I, I'm, I'm not so serious about my music as I used to be that, no, you're not going to do that. That would change the integrity of what I do. I'm not like that anymore. So I said, go for it. Let's see what happens. And I, I like it. I, I think it's I think it's very different. And I think that for folks that go out to dance to music in a club, I think, you know, for once they might be able to do that to Brian McKnight. That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Brian, before we say goodbye, could you uh, remind our viewers where they can go to follow you online and then also learn more about Remixed and what's ahead for you? So you can follow me on Instagram at Brian McKnight 23 on Twitter at It's B McKnight. Um, all of my tour dates are on McKnight360.com and Facebook backslash Brian McKnight for all the latest on me. Um, after this Remixed album, I... Um, I wrote a song called Faithfully that I think is, again, one of the greatest songs I've ever written. But of course, I am my biggest fan, so I think that everything I do is great. But this one is just, it's different. It's, it's definitely a throwback to some of the 90s. So as we're producing this new song, um, we're trying to throw back but keep it current. That's the constant line you kind of have to walk down. I cannot just create today's music. I guess I could create it, but I couldn't put it out because like, you're just trying to be like so-and-so. But if I do what I always do, I'm like, well, that just sounds like what you always do. So you kind of have to walk down this fine line. So later on this year, we'll, we'll hear this thing. And it's really a, it's sort of my, another another ode to my wife because she inspired this one too, so. I was just Dang. gonna ask, is it about Leilani? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah! Excellent. Every single one. Well, sure. well, we're we're gonna give a big shout out to Leilani because uh, she she gonna keep you in the game. She gonna keep you writing music. She gonna keep you inspired. So, uh, big shout out to your wife for uh, keeping you keeping you uh, you know blessing us with your music. They just shouted you out, baby. You, you, heard, okay. <laughs> you got the dog. The dog's got a bit of a yap, so she's he's probably holding his head just like this. <laughs> So Brian, it's been a, a absolute <laughs> honor to have you with us today. It's been a treat for me because, like I said, you you were a part of my childhood uh, and adulthood. Um, you, you've and, and the music that you've done has inspired so many people across the world. So, uh, man, it's just you, your legacy is going to live on forever, and we appreciate the song, even though you, you didn't even know what you were talking about 
uh, back in 22, you, you were just writing <laughs> because you had read a, a romance novel or, or something. You were living vicariously through other people. Uh, man, you, those, those songs uh, are kind of, yeah, they're, they're part of my fabric. So uh, thank you for what you do. Uh, on behalf of all the men and women that wear the uniform, thank you for, you know, music takes us away from all the craziness that we deal with on a regular basis. And uh, you definitely honor a lot of our playlists. So thank you so much for what you've done. Uh, and, and just spending time with us today. Uh, I know you, you, you're a busy man and uh, you got, you got, you know, stuff you got to do with your, your family and, uh, but you, you know, taking out your time to kind of chop it up with us is, is awesome. So thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me so much. And to, to everyone out there that's watching, thank you so much for your service. Please be safe out there and, and, and take care of one another. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. So we wish you all the best. And if you can hang on uh, after the live, I got a, uh, I got something for you. So uh, thank you so much. But uh, with that being said, Chief Chat out.